Unfortunately, missing a slide. Um, okay, sorry. Let me just adapt here for a second. What the um, what the uh, uh, library allows us to do is because we've documented all that all of those ions are in fact all ion features are related to phenylalanine. We can then deconvolute that data and say, okay, well we're just going to send one of those ion features into STAT um, in order to uh, for it to represent phenylalanine, thus reducing the false discovery rate and reducing um, any potential for uh, skewing of the statistics. Um, now, I just want to point out at this point, you'll, a lot of times in the field, you'll feel people quoting, um, you know, we detected thousands and thousands of ion features. Um, it's important to understand that an ion feature does not equal a metabolite. Okay, because of this issue, because of the redundancy and the number of different ions that every single molecule were produced, we found through our analysis that every molecule produces on an average of about seven ions in, in an actual experimental sample. So that's a lot of redundancy built in. Um, so just be careful when somebody quotes that they detect thousands of ion features. That doesn't mean thousands of metabolites. That means hundreds of metabolites probably, but certainly not thousands. So it's an important thing to sort of pay attention to uh, when you're out in the field uh, looking around. Uh, so again, the, the real importance of the library is that it certainly helped us make the identifications faster, save us a lot of time there, but it also had this alternative advantage of helping us clean up stats. Okay, so overall the process itself uh, is pretty standard. Once the data is collected, after the data is collected, the first thing it does is it goes through an uh, in-house software, uh, in software package called Metabolizer. This is our own uh, peak detection and integration, uh, integration software package. Um, and every peak is, is interrogated. All it has to do is meet some minimum signal to noise and area thresholds criteria to be able to um, be flagged as a, as a peak. Once peaks have been identified and integrated, um, each peak or each ion feature is then searched against the database of standards and the identifications are made. Now, if we relied solely on uh, the ability, or if, sorry, if we, if we relied solely on the presence of, of a detected molecule having to be in the library, or if we relied solely on the library, it would be in essence, a very large targeted method, but not a truly non-targeted method. Um, so for that reason, it's really important that after, after it's been searched against the library, we actually have a separate package that comes in and looks for ion features that essentially do not have a home. They do not have a library entry associated with them. Those ion features are then flagged for someone like myself to go in and say, okay, do these new ion features represent a new and undocumented biochemical that has not been identified and is not currently in our library? Okay, so we look at things like uh, the MSMS reproducibility, retention time reproducibility. Can we find a cluster of ions that all seem to be related? You know, can we find ions that look like the sodium addict and the ammonium addict and maybe the dimer of the same new molecule? So if it sort of meets that criteria, then what we do is we give that new unknown biochemical a numerical value so that we can track it from that point forward. So even though we don't necessarily know what the identity of that molecule is, we can track it and you know, see that, that that particular compound always shows up in urine or it always shows up when we analyze liver. Um, and then at some point, if that unknown becomes important in a study, we have the capability to go and do some pure structure elucidation. Uh, so that's a very important aspect of, of making sure that you don't limit yourself to what you already have in your library. Um, a large part of any analytical platform is really uh, making sure that its quality is, is of the highest possible. Um, and the only way to do this is heavily monitor your process. Um, my husband is an organic synthetic chemist and he's always telling me, you know, junk in, junk out. And I think this works in our field as well. Um, if you put a lot of um, quote unquote junky data into stats, you're going to have a harder time picking out the real signals on the back end. So it's important to make sure that the data goes in, the data that does go in is really a very good quality. 
Um, so very standard. Uh, we have a series of um, small molecule standards uh, that go in at various points of the process. We have recovery standards which are spiked and prior to extraction, which allows us to monitor the extraction process. Uh, we have uh, internal standards that are spiked in just prior to instrument analysis. This allows us to monitor things like LC drift or chromatography drift over the night or if there's any um, sensitivity drift for the mass spec overnight. And then we also have standards spiked in to monitor the derivatization reaction for the GC to make sure that the reaction is going to completion. Now, we also have a series of um, QC samples. Now, actually, 30% of all of the samples that we run every night is dedicated to QC. And this is primarily as a result of these two different types of samples. The first one is what we call a matrix or a C matrix. Um, and this is run every six injections. What this is, is we take a small aliquot of all of the samples in the study and we create a pool. We then run that pool as a technical replicate every six injections. Now, that piece of information uh, serves to essentially give you process variability on every molecule in your study, uh, importantly, in the context of the matrix that you're looking in. So if after your study is complete, you find out that you know, phenylalanine is upregulated 2.5 folds, you can go look at the technical replicate and say, okay, well, when we ran the technical replicate, phenylalanine only varied 4%. So it's a very important key piece of information for you to have so that you can say to yourself, um, you know, I know that that 2.5 fold is really biologically driven and is not a result of the process. The other sample we run is a process blank, and all this is is an aliquot of water run through the entire process extraction and analysis. Um, now, why this is important is this allows us to tease out the molecules that are not a result of the biological samples, but are really solely a result of the process. And let me show you an example of this. So what we have here is a, uh, this is a selected ion chromatogram for uh, the experimental sample of the human plasma sample, and then the corresponding process blank or water blank. And what you can see is that your two major signals in your experimental sample are actually from the process. They are related to the process itself, and they have actually nothing to do with the biological samples. And in fact, the only real biological signals you have are these two peaks um, closer to baseline. So what we use this information for is we remove these signals in the experimental samples, again, before it goes to stats, again, reducing the opportunity for false discovery and cleaning up the data as much as possible before it goes to stats. The last major aspect of the QC is that we actually go through and QC all of the library calls made um, by the software. We have a program called Visual Fill, or for short, VFill, that was developed in-house specifically for us. And before I go into this too much detail, uh, let me blow up one of these plots so that you can, so I can uh, show you uh, exactly what you're looking at here. Um, this is essentially a view of the um, of the of uh, of your data set from you know, sort of 30,000 feet. What you're looking at here on the x-axis is retention time, okay? And on the y-axis are all of the samples in your study. Each one of these points that you see here represent an actual chromatographic peak in your data. So that you can see, uh, so each one of these points has an area associated with it, has a peak apex, peak start, peak stop. Um, so each point is essentially just a chromatographic peak. And what this view allows you to do is see all of the calls for this given compound. In this particular case, it's pyroglutanic acid. So you can see that your experimental samples are sort of in here in the middle. That technical replicate is down here at the bottom and the water blanks are up here at the top. So you see that we're not getting any signals or any calls in the water blanks, which, allow, which informs us that this is, in fact, not an artifact. So if we go back to this view, um, what you'll see is that this, these three panels, these three panels are the, um, the three platform measurements for pyroglutamic acid. This is the GC, LC pods, and LC meg. Okay? From this view, we can assess things like um, 
how good is the MSMS spectral match? The color is actually important here and also the shape of these molecules in informing us whether or not the MSMS match is really good. If it's not a great MSMS match, it's flagged so that you can go in and review it and say, okay, what's going on? And in some cases it says, you know what, the MSMS match is so poor here, it's just going to be ignored because this is not a good call. The other thing that we can do here is remove, you know, the compounds that have the process contribution. We can also remove, uh, you know, bad or poor peak integration because no peak integration software is perfect, unfortunately. Uh, it just allows us to clean up the data.